Okay. Hello, folks. This is Rifat Bari Brown, University graduate student in physics. And my name is Sabor Ajiperi, and I'm doing my BS in math and physics at NYU. So tell us what we're going to be learning today. Yeah, so today we're just doing some reviews of how tensors work, tensor algebra, how tensors interact with each other, basic axioms. So why don't we start off with a sheet of paper. Show this paper to the viewers. How do we know this paper is flat exactly? Now, we can describe this paper using different coordinate systems. For example, we can describe it with a curvilinear coordinate system. Take a look at this coordinate system. Yep, okay. it looks it's pretty described nice. described by a metric G sub MN, right? Mm -hmm. Or you can describe it with a Cartesian coordinate system. Looks pretty that straight. That looks like this. Okay, all of the different, coordinates right? are orthogonal. Can you tell me what the difference between these two are? Well, I mean, one is straight and another is curvy, of course. Yes, exactly. And one makes it easy to calculate distances on the sheet of paper. The other makes it harder, right? Well, it depends on what surface you're using, but yes. Well, on this flat sheet of paper. Flat? No. When you do this to the paper, does it change the curviness of the paper? No. Nope. It changes the extrinsic curviness. In other words, it changes how the paper is embedded in 3D space. But it does not change the intrinsic curvature of the paper. So the curvature see. of the paper is the same now, as it is now, as it is now. So the metric tensor is not affected when you do all these bends and folds. No. Interesting. Okay. So let's get started with the geometric interpretation of the two main types of vectors in GR, right? Contravariant so, and covariant. Yeah. Can you tell viewers a little bit uh, about contravariant and covariant? Just Shed some light on what we already know, and then I'll add the geometric interpretation. So we just sum over some dummy variable p. So it should just be partial xm, partial yp, partial xp. No. Okay. Um, I don't know. I think I did something wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is how it works. Yeah, very close. So you want to, first of all, you're trying to find what this small displacement x is in, in terms of the y mm -hmm. coordinates, right? Yeah. So y should be somewhere here, first of all. Oh, sorry. Right? Oops. But okay. where should it be? That's a good question. Should it be like this? So you could do that, but you see then, the dummy vari variable is p. So if p is attached to y, oh, it just then y out. would be left over with no variable. So that means the only thing it can be is this one, That's both right. of these are x's. That's right. So you see, the rules always work, even if you forget how to apply them. I see. So now, just by looking at what the dummy variable should be attached to, you know that y should be the one with m, right? Interesting. So, okay, good. Yep. Exactly. That's exactly right. Now, if you forgot it, you could also have... Uh, motivated it like this. If you want to know a small change dym, you could see how each component of y responds to each component of x and then multiply by that change in x, which is exactly what you have here. Okay, uh, you want to explain what covariant tensors are? We have essentially a scalar field and we uh, want to express the difference when we make a small change in that scalar field like going from three to two. So we get ds dxm, where this is our contravariant from before, should be able to write partial s partial xp partial xp partial ym. Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah. So can you explain how you came up with that? Uh, all yeah. right. So Oh, I'm pretty sure it's actually DXP, DYM. Oh, that actually I don't really care. Okay. But anyway, this is A, kind of similar to the chain rule, and B, mm -hmm. all we really have to do here is just get DS, DYM. So we go procedurally. Mm -hmm. The X's have to cancel out in the final thing. So we're just summing over it as a dummy variable. Yeah. So we already know that if we have DS, uh, D sum coordinate, this is just going to be partial S, partial X, and then a DX times whatever variable you're parametrizing over. I'm okay. Sorry, this. So in the same way, we're summing this over if you want to do it with multiple coordinates, mm -hmm. in the same way, 
we have the formula. Okay. So now let me generalize the equations you wrote down for the transformation of contravariant and covariant. Can you write a covariant up there? Mm -hmm. So first, let's look at the general form of the contravariant transformation. So dy, I'm going to replace that with the coordinates of the tensor v in the new reference frame. So these are the components. And the components are, instead of dxp, I'm going to call it vp. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'll multiply that by partial ym, partial xp. Good. Mm -hmm. So this is the general transformation law for contravariant, which we recall from last time. And here, I do something very similar. I'm going to call this, this is a covariant or contravariant? Uh, covariant. Covariant. So let me call it w prime, prime because I'm working on the new reference frame. And I'm going to put the index at the top or bottom? Uh, on the bottom. Bottom, right. We use a subscript because exactly. it's covariant. And I'm going to call this partial s partial xp. I'm going to call that w sub, what should I write? Hmm. Shouldn't we write sub p? Sub p because 1 over a contravariant is covariant. Co and then and I this have, is contravariant. Yeah. dxp d y m wait should it be a partial sign yes okay. okay yeah so now see the repeated index is the dummy variable so i should just be left with one over a contravariant which gives me my covariant so hopefully everyone understands the formula behind it okay so this is for contravariant vectors just like you wrote and this is for covariant vectors so first let me divide these two let's say that we have a non-orthogonal system of coordinates. So what does that mean? Can you tell viewers what non-orthogonal means? So orthogonal means perpendicular. So to me, the non-orthogonal would be a space in which our three bases are not perpendicular to one another, mm -hmm. i.e. their dot product is not zero. So let's say we have two coordinates uh, like this, and let me draw a vector v as follows. Now, the contravariant components of this vector v are just the parallel projection of our vector onto both of the coordinate axes. Mm -hmm. So let me see, here is the x component, or what is in this case v sub 1, and here is the y component, very, or v sub 2, yeah, very for our parallel. vector. It is parallel, it is parallel. So that is the idea for contravariant components. For contravariant components, they're literally the components that you use to write out the vector in its basis form as follows. Mm. You see, that's mm -hmm. it. Now, covariant is a little bit different. Covariant components of our vector, again, here are our orthogonal, or like their rough coordinates, and here is my vector v. Now, here, I'm going to project my vector v perpendicular to both coordinates. So now here is, what is this component here? It's actually V, the vector V dotted with the first basis vector. Hmm. And this component here is the vector V dotted with the second basis vector. But wait, can we also use this the... This is the unit basis vector, so let me... Yeah. Can we just use the projection formula to find the uh, values of V1 and V2? You could, but basically covariant components of our vector v are defined to be as follows. v sub n is the vector v dotted with the n basis vector. So these over here, v sub 1, v sub 2, and so on, these are our contravariant components for our vector, and these are our covariant com components for our vector. This is mechanism. Okay. So is this okay so far? This yep. makes sense? Now we can take it one step further. Let me take a look at what happens when you take the vector v and express it in terms of its basis vectors. Well, you take your contravariant component and multiply it with your basis vector. Ah, so expanding it to more than two dimensions. That's right. And of course there's a hidden sigma. That's right, because this is summation convention. Now, what if we take this vector v and we dot it with one of our basis vectors, let's say e sub n, then what do we get? 
But wait, I have. We a... get the end component of v. Yes, go ahead. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. So here, what we're doing is essentially we have. Uh, oh, wait a second. Mm -hmm. So we have every single component, and we're just summing them up and then adding them right here. So we have essentially, like, for example, the first term might be v1, uh, e1 dot e n. Exactly. And so you get the, oh, wait. Ah, yeah, I see. You see? Yep. Pretty cool, right? So now, exactly like you suggested, I instead of v, I'm going to replace that by the expansion of v in terms of its basis components. You see? Now it turns out that this right here, this is the metric tensor hiding in plain sight. E sub m dotted with E sub n turns out to be the metric tensor. But why? Well, the reason why that's the metric tensor is as follows. Remember the metric tensor tells us how to compute distances between any two points on a given manifold, right? Yep. So if I have the following, V dotted with V, V dotted with V, what does that give me? Uh, shouldn't that just give you the magnitude of V squared? Absolutely. But I know that V, it can also be written in terms of its basis vectors. And likewise with this V, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to use different indices because these are just dummy variables. But now, V sub M and V sub M, those are just contravariant scalars, right? So let me take those out. And so I have E sub M dotted with E sub N. But hey, what is this if not telling me how to compute the length of any given vector on my manifold? And so this right here makes sense to call this the metric tensor or the metric G sub M N. So to summarize the four big ideas that we talked about today, the four big relations are as follows. The first big relation is that a vector v can be written in terms of its contravariant components as follows. These are the contravariant components of the vector v, but we also define the covariant components as the dot product of the vector v with the nth basis vector. And then we also saw how the metric tensor is pops out as the dot product of two different basis vectors. And finally, we saw the connection between covariant and contravariant vectors in terms of the basis, uh, in terms of the metric tensor. But why is this true? Well, just check it out. You can just write this as e sub n, e sub n dotted with each other, and then multiply that with v sub m. Mm -hmm. And so if I take v sub m out here, and this is v sub m, e sub m dotted with e sub n. But what is V sub M uh, times E sub M? Wait, if not, have we already calculated that? Exactly, that's just V. So this is just V dotted with E sub N. And of oh, course, that second. gives us back the covariant components. So these are the four relations, the four big relations that we have discovered today. Cool. Okay, thank you for watching.